tapestry of life. What do I mean when we say the uh, life might work in a particular way? Well, our entire existence is based on a coding structure built into DNA. You've probably heard of sequencing DNA and matching the sequence. And that's shown here. We've got that famous double helix on the uh, right of center. And the little uh, black helices are made of the uh, chains of sugar molecules that hold it all together. And in the center, we have the bases, the nucleotide bases. And there are four of them given four different colors there, cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. And you can see that two of them are smaller than the other two. Two of them have one ring of atoms in them and the other two have two. And so it turns out that you can form a bridge between the two sides of the helix, but that bridge has to consist of a G and a C or an A and a T and no other combinations will give you the right fit. And it is entirely that that Crick and Watson figured out and that is the basis upon which the order of these uh, bases in the uh, helix there, as you read it off, uh, works. And if you only have one of the strands, then you can make a new strand because you've only got one choice at each position to choose to make a new strand because only one of the other bases will fit against the one you're copying. And so that's how the replication works. The two strands unwind and new strands are made against them using them as a template. Now on the left there you've got RNA which is also involved and so this uh, pesky virus that's going around is an RNA virus. It's a single strand so it doesn't have that same robustness of the checking of one side against the other. Uh, that makes it mutate faster but that's another whole story. So here's Carl Sagan and he was uh, very much uh, a thinker involved in the whole idea about how life might work in other ways and the possibilities for life on other planets that might be not like our own earthly life. Now he figured that life shared various characteristics. Life is the process of molecules that manage to reproduce themselves and somehow use energy and food to do that and they tend to need to live in a liquid because a liquid environment allows the food to arrive and the waste products to be washed away and so he thought about what other liquids might work and he thought maybe the water could be replaced by in an alien uh, chemistry by liquid ammonia or hydrocarbons or liquid nitrogen or hydrogen sulfide or several others so things like uh, hydrogen cyanide considered. Now most of these need to be at lower temperatures it's quite interesting water is the uh, liquid of all of these that is a liquid at the highest temperature at ordinary uh, earthly pressures. Of course things change if you increase the pressure and one of the uh, molecules that's considered that's not in that list would be sulfuric acid H2SO4 and at high pressure sulfuric acid can be a liquid uh, up to much higher temperatures than water. They also ask the question is carbon the only choice for making the framework of life? Now carbon has advantages for doing this really illustrated by the picture of loads of different carbon molecules on the right hand side there because it can bond to itself very strongly and to other elements very well as well and form long complicated chains and branching structures that lead to that huge diversity that uh, allows it to do all of the things that life needs it to do and it's also electrically fairly neutral which means that you can modify its behavior by adding more negative or more positive elements and uh, tweak the electrochemistry of what's going on. So what about other elements? Can they do that too? 
The first and most popular choice really is silicon, and silicon can do the same thing. It can form long chains, it can form sheets, it can form rings and branching structures. But silicon to silicon bonds are not very strong. Um, and they would fall apart at the sort of temperatures that uh, we exist at. Too much energy in the environment would shake them apart. And also they'd have to avoid oxygen because oxygen tears these silanes, these uh, chains of silicon atoms apart. But it's not the only way to do it. You've probably heard of silicone. It's used in breast implants and it's used in uh, making uh, window sealants and bathroom sealants, depending on exactly what type of silicone it is. And silicone as opposed to silicon is silicon and oxygen alternating, S-I-O, S-I-O, as shown in that chain there, perhaps with side chains or perhaps with rings with carbon CH3s groups, methyl, methyl groups stuck on the outside. And so all sorts of interesting chemistry comes about. And it's entirely possible that uh, this would be a possibility for creating enough diversity to uh, form uh, the basis of a different type of life. Sulfur, well, sulfur can form chains and rings and different structures as well. And what's very, very interesting indeed about sulfur is that it has a strong affinity for iron. And in fact, life on Earth may have begun as a combination of iron and sulfur, the so-called iron sulfur world hypothesis. It's possible that it predated even the existence of anything as complicated as uh, RNA and was fossilized into life as we have it today many times over because here we've got the core of a, an existing enzyme called ferrodoxin that is in a lot of different uh, functions in the uh, body and you have two iron atoms bonded together by sulfur s and fe in the middle of that little cluster attached to some cysteine uh, residues in and then there's the rest of the protein not shown but these are often the core sites within enzymes turn out to be these little clusters of iron and sulfur that have been bonded into the proteins and these are the places where the chemical processing the chemical factories of our enzymes actually take place on these metal sulfur centers and so the idea is that perhaps in the very earliest uh, environments of the hot smokers at the bottom of the deep oceans where a lot of iron and sulfur is spewing out of the core of uh, the planet that it started to bond together and act as a chemical factory and then life formed around these uh, iron sulfur cores and we still see them fossilized in our enzymes even to this day because they're so important to us. There are other elements, boron can form complicated cluster structures, uh, but boron's not very common. So I, I'm not a fan of boron as a particular thing. We, we saw how beryllium and boron really don't uh, exist very widely in nature. Whereas things like sulfur and oxygen and silicon really do. So what about this in practice? Well, here's Europa, moon of Jupiter, and this is possibly an iron sulfur world going on doing interesting organic chemistry, life at its very earliest stage deep inside Europa. Of course, it may have gone further than that. A lot of iron sulfur living bacteria live around hydrothermal vents on Earth, and they are that color brown that you see coming through the cracks of Europa up from the salty ocean underneath. Here's Io, and there's good evidence to show that there's plentiful hydrogen sulfide, H2S, the gas that smells of bad eggs. But deep inside Io, it could exist as a liquid and maybe providing 
a liquid environment in, in which all sorts of interesting uh, sulfur-based chemistry might be going on. Perhaps there are also oxides of sulfur like sulfur dioxide and trioxide and uh, H2SO4, sulfuric acid, deep in the core. That could be another potential chemical factory uh, uh, solution. Then we have Titan here where we have a thick atmosphere and we have those liquid methane rivers and lakes and rain and snow of organic chemicals and a temperature of minus 160. So there's plenty going on in terms of organic molecules but it's a bit cold for our kind of life. But maybe some other form of life based on uh, some of those other uh, solutions that we talked about using the liquid methane and ethane as a solvent um, and perhaps using silicones as the building blocks that don't tend to freeze uh, if you uh, build them correctly might work. And of course this is Triton at Neptune where we see the black liquid nitrogen powered geysers and liquid nitrogen was another solvent that uh, Carl Sagan mentioned as a potential liquid habitat. So even though this is minus 220 degrees C, perhaps there's uh, chemistry on the way to forming interesting uh, results going on in the pockets of liquid nitrogen underneath all of that pink snow there. More hypothetical, this is a artist's impression of an ammonia planet where liquid ammonia as suggested by Sagan substitutes for water and the temperatures are somewhere in the region of you know minus 78 to minus 33 with one atmosphere pressure that liquid uh, ammonia would be a liquid at that temperature and it's a very good solvent and it's reasonably abundant uh, hydrogen of course is very common and NH3 is hydrogen with nitrogen and by virtue of the uh, the uh, uh, S and R processes there's a lot of nitrogen around because it gets made from carbon in stars. And just the other day uh, this was published which was uh, the idea of hydrogen atmosphere planets which might well have uh, the possibility of life because uh, this was Sarah Sager of uh, MIT and she uh, did an experiment by taking yeast and E. coli microbes and putting them under an atmosphere of pure hydrogen and leaving them for a while with, with an organic broth uh, to uh, feed upon. And it worked, they happily replicated uh, on these, uh, in these conditions. And she did the same under other conditions as well with more Earth-like atmospheres. The Earth-like atmosphere was the best because that's what they're evolved to do, but nevertheless, they were somehow managing to uh, breed and replicate even in these weird conditions. And perhaps this would represent uh, deep in the ocean of some of the uh, giant planets, deep in the interior of them. And now we also had a, just to wrap, wrap this up, a little look at Mars. We mustn't forget Mars. There seem to be seasonal outgassings of methane coming from somewhere deep underground in uh, the uh, surface of Mars. Now this could be an inorganic source of methane, it could be methane trapped inside other little cage molecules made of water, these meth methane clathrate structures just periodically outgassing as they warmed up. But the question really is, how did the methane get there in the first place? And a lot of microbes in the absence of oxygen on Earth, the anaerobes, form methane as a waste product um, from other materials. And uh, they can take carbon dioxide and water and use the same iron sulfur chemistry to catalyze the conversion of that into methane and derive energy and do their, do their uh, microbe things and replicate as a result. And uh, 
it's very interesting to see that we're seeing these seasonal methane plumes on Mars. Here's a little graphic showing how in the northern summer the concentration of methane goes up and uh, then it falls away again. It's being destroyed by the action of uh, ultraviolet light from the sun.